Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for joining the session on Breaking Barriers, how UN 2.0 supports an inclusive future for women and girls. It is my pleasure to be here today and moderate this session. My name is Gerda Binda. I'm the Senior Advisor for Gender and Digital with UNICEF. I work especially on closing the gender digital divide for girls and women. We have esteemed panelists with us today who will share examples of initiatives that foster gender equality when applying the UN 2.0 expertise and skills. But before we move into the panel presentation, I would like to share with you a few points about UN 2.0 and the Quintet of Change. Next slide, please. UN 2.0 is the UN Secretary General's vision of a modernized UN system for stronger results and greater SDG impact. Through forward thinking and expertise across the quintet of change, that includes data, digital, innovation, foresight, and behavioral science. UN 2.0 is about how we can better leverage new expertise in these five areas across our programs while fostering a dynamic, diverse, and curious organizational culture where these new skills can thrive. UN 2.0 is about building a UN system that can better support member states in this 21st century. The UN 2.0 week showcases how UN entities are already applying data, digital, innovation, foresight, and behavioral science and culture in action. So yesterday, the high level opening session took place and there are more sessions now that you can join on education, the environment, or sessions exploring critical enablers of successful transformations. This week will re feature speakers from over 30 UN entities. Next slide, please. So without further ado, I would like to start our thematic session on how UN 2.0 supports an inclusive future for women and girls. As you know, globally, women and girls remain heavily disadvantaged. They are disproportionately likely to experience hunger, illiteracy, low wage employment, violence, and discrimination. While some progress has been made, the world is still not on track to achieve gender equality. Our panel will share how UN 2.0 capabilities can accelerate our collective journey towards gender equality. You will hear about initiatives from UNFPA, OHCHR, and UN Women that are leveraging disaggregated data to drive targeted policymaking and programming, digital technologies to support female human rights defenders, and behavioral science to address gender disparities in family care. If you have any questions or suggestions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can also like questions and upvote them that you are interested in to be discussed in the Q&A segment after each presentation. And with that, I would like to invite our first speaker to take the floor. Ms. Priscilla Idele is Chief of the Population and Development Branch of UNFPA. She has been leading a wide range of important initiatives and high-level events for data advocacy, investment, and partnerships. Priscilla also served as Deputy Director of the UNICEF Office of Research and was the Global Chief of Data and Analytics. With that, Priscilla, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Gerda, and thanks for that kind introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, as Gerda has mentioned, uh, this is one use case uh, uh, from UNFPA in which I'm going to speak about the population data portal, an example of how we are advancing the sector general's UN 2.0 and the quintet of change on data for greater insights and impacts. So that slide uh, is showing us just the components of our flagship product that we use not only to disseminate information, but also to visualize georeference 
uh, population, health, and gender data for about 200 indicators and above, uh, which includes indicators on SDGs, on the ICPD, and other indicators of interest to UNFPA uh, specifically. So the B a PDP, as we call it in short, uh, is a dissemination tool and a global public resource for disaggregated data up to the subnational level, uh, because our emphasis is ensuring that nobody is left behind. And this can be used by governments, by the UN, by everybody everywhere across the world. It's publicly available. The emphasis in the PDP is on combining geospatial population data and program data to map out availability, access, and use of essential services, such as health, as school facilities, as well as road networks. The PDP also recognizes that the limitations of national aggregate data and, uh, uh, and, and emphasizes that data has to be disaggregated, not only at subnational level, but also by key characteristics to ensure that we identify underserved locations, but also marginalized and vulnerable subpopulation groups. So the PDP serves as a very important resource for uh, data that is harmonized across different sources, but more importantly, also includes the latest population census, uh, and, uh, which is data from our governments that we partner with. Next slide, please. The PDP covers a wide range of domains, and uh, I'll only speak to one of the domains uh, as uh, it applies to this session, the gender equality domain. It includes about 74 indicators on sexual and reproductive uh, health and rights, violence against women, child marriage, and female genital mutilation. All indicators in the PDP are sex disaggregated and were applicable by also other stratifiers, uh, such as age, education, place of residence, and wealth status. Next slide, please. The PDP makes it simple to create a thematic or national specific dashboards that fit specific program objectives. For example, as you can see on uh, this slide, we have a slide on that monitors the planning and implementation of the censuses. But we also produce lots of um, thematic uh, dashboards such as mapping of gender-based violence, harmful practices such as um, uh, child marriage, as well as uh, female genital mutilation, but also a set of life-saving interventions uh, on obstetric care and newborn uh, care. So, so there are lots of dashboards that one can generate. And one of these um, uh, impact of these dashboards has been demonstrated in Haiti in which the geospatial dashboard on intimate partner violence was used by the government and partners in, um, in Haiti to develop a country's plan to address all forms of violence against women. And of course, we know the situation there, and, uh, but uh, there are attempts to do that. Um, next slide, please. This one, this slide just is similar to what happened in Haiti. In Zambia, UNFPS supported the mapping of the prevalence of child marriage and the number of child brides by subnational areas and identified regions with high prevalence and numbers of uh, child brides. This ultimately informed the development of the seventh national development plan uh, of Zambia. And, um, and there are many other use cases of this nature that I can't talk about, um, you know, all of them. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, the the last slide was just to 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 give you um the website where you can go uh, to look for more information and to learn more about the contents of the PDP, which is www.pdp.unfpa.org, and uh, and feel free also to write to us uh, directly if you have specific questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priscilla. It's amazing to see these slides with the visualization of the data and the statistics. Can I encourage all participants, you're free to put questions for Priscilla in the Q&A box. And while you do that, maybe Priscilla, if you allow me a question to you to further mm -hmm. elaborate why gender statistics and sex disaggregated data is important, especially for women and girls. 
I, I think thanks, Gerda, for that uh, question. Um, sometimes we take things for granted and make them obvious. But uh, essentially, uh, for me, having been in the data and, and uh, gender statistics for many, many years, I always start by saying that what gets measured gets done. So if we don't measure it and disaggregate it and uh, outline the differences between men and women and other issues around the world, that will not be you know, recognized and therefore it will be in, uh, in the dark. So gender statistics and sex disaggregated data are essential for spotlighting inequalities that we often talk about and are also addressing the needs of my marginalized girls and women. For example, globally, about 32% of young women aged 15 to 24 years were not in education, employment, or training compared to 15% of young men. And that is just glaring. If we didn't measure it, we wouldn't know that that's happening. So accurate sex disaggregate data is crucial for developing also policies and programs that effectively respond to the unique needs of girls and women. So, and, and that's what makes it important. There are many other examples of why disaggregated data, but I will leave it there and, 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 and let the others also, you know, talk. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, we got a question about the software that was used to build the site. And um, if you're interested, um, there's also an answer in the Q&A box that gives you the link. But if you'd like to speak to that, Priscilla, for a moment, that would be great too. Mm. Where is the question? I don't see it. So it's in the Q&A box and just asking which platform okay, or right. software was used to build the site. So there are several questions. Is there another tool which can replace the one you have spoken about and what is important importance of DP? It's PDP. <laughs> PDP is a, a custom built um, a platform and we have been working with different solution providers, uh, specifically S3, but also our IT you know, um, colleagues at UNFPA and, um, and other UN uh, constituencies, including the private sector. So, so there has been a lot of you know, um, teamwork and collaboration around the data portal. And um and and I think I won't go into the details of uh, essentially the technical components of it. Thank you so much, Priscilla, for sharing this. Um, as new more questions come in, in the interest of time, uh, we will now move uh, turn to our second speaker. Mr. Anwar Mahfoud is the Chief of Digital Transformation at OHCHR, and he drives digital innovation by implementing a holistic digital transformation strategy for enhancing operational effectiveness and efficiency. Anwar, over to you, the floor is yours. Thanks, Garda, and uh, um, great and exciting work uh, fr from Priscilla. Uh, congratulations uh, for that presentation. So um, it's my pleasure, of course, today to join uh, fellow panelists and everyone here to discuss this important topic on how we can leverage UN 2.0 to break the barriers and support an inclusive future for women and girls. I'm going to highlight um, a little bit. I don't have slides, uh, but I will speak about uh, some of the efforts uh, to, that we've uh, used to leverage digital technology to overcome some of the challenges uh, we, we have had uh, in the office. So um, OHHR is responsible for the methodology, data compilation and dissemination of uh, for human rights indicators in the SDG progress report. One of those indicators is the killings and, and other attacks on human rights defenders, journalists and trade unionists, that's SDG 1610. The indicator is 
as Priscilla mentioned, and she really highlighted that a in a little bit more detail uh, as well, um, gathering quality data um, and in a disaggregated fashion um, to create accurate reports, especially on threats and attacks against human rights defenders, is especially and especially female human rights defenders, can be quite challenging uh, to collect. Public records, uh, which we rely uh, to collect such data, can be confusing. Uh, despite underground monitoring, media reports, Google searches um, about the names and the incidents and where they've happened, or information from civil society organizations. They all pose a lot of manual and, and painstaking work. Uh, you would have to sift through all these pieces of information and try to gather insights uh, on, 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 the, on, on um, the, the, the perpetrators and, and more importantly, uh, the attacks uh, on, on the human rights defenders. We needed to complement uh, the data that we gather uh, for, for this indicator with uh, to sort of also uh, uh, um, uh, identify some of the underlying disparities. So to get it to get more disaggregated uh, aspects and sort of we can make more in, gather more insights from the data that we've collected, especially on issues of gender, uh, and here I'm talking about, of course, uh, identifying, for example, male versus female human rights defenders, where they are, and, and the incidents, and so on and so forth. So we partnered with Data Miner, uh, who supported us uh, with an information extraction AI model, where we was scraping open source data uh, from different sources, and we were using this data initially, of course, to train this AI model uh, and help us to filter and classify uh, this data so we can sort of understand and collect, make sure we can sort of uh, slice the data in a uh, disaggregated form, uh, fashion to be able to understand and, and highlight some of these uh, incidents that relate to female human rights defenders. Uh, ideally, we would normally uh, verify about 400 reports annually, but through this collaboration and through this effort, we um, had about 400 leads a day that we collected through this model that we were able to verify and, and it really enhanced the way we um, collect and, and, and identify some of these gender uh, discriminations uh, in terms of the incidents affecting the female human rights defenders. Thank you so much for sharing about this really important work in support of human rights defenders, Anwar. Um, I see questions coming in from the Q&A box, but maybe if you allow us to, if allow me to start us off. Um, I am particularly interested in what you see is the impact of this work for female human rights defenders. Thanks. And um, I, I also think uh, Priscilla did uh, highlight a little bit of this, but specifically for this project, I think this was super important uh, in terms of the impact uh, of the project. We many a times we realized that uh, and I saw one of the questions in the box about, you know, uh, what platform, um, you know, Priscilla was 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 presenting and how whether there's another platform that does the same things and so on and so forth. Um, I think it's really important to keep our eye on the ball, which in, in my opinion is sort of uh, what is the impact of all this sort of transformation that we're doing. We need to ground it on specific uh, impact and how it affects everyday communities and so on. So one of the areas that this particular model um, uh, helped us is identifying gender-based discrimination. So for example, uh, we were looking at, you know, attacks uh, between a male versus female human rights defenders, and and um, which can be different in some cases on similar incidents, and, and you could see the way uh, things were being uh, sort of the the, the way um, these types of issues were being handled, and we could be able to sort of intervene. It also uh, promoting the visibility and recognition of these gender-based disparities help us to advocate. Uh, for support, uh, resources, and also protection of female human rights defenders. So we're using the disaggregated data to sort of uh, guide us in terms of our, our policies, uh, ensure an inclusivity in terms of our policy development and strategies, and also measure the progress over time. And I think one of the 
uh, other aspect that is also super important that that this helped us to do was uh, it amplified the voices of the of the female human rights defenders. So through this targeted advocacy and policy interventions, for example, recognizing um, female human rights defenders provides role models for other women and girls, inspiring them to stand up for their rights and become agents of change within their communities. Thank you, Anwar. I see in the Q&A box a question about the partnership with the data mentor, but since we will have a second segment in this session where we'll go dive deeper into partnerships, maybe I can go to the question uh, that is asked about um, how you would address implicit bias in the underlying data when you are relying on data scrapping. How much does this matter for gender and younger women in particular? If this has been upvoted, so I've picked that one, but Anwar, there are more questions in the chat, longer questions that you maybe then can answer directly in the box. Thank you. Thanks, Garth. That's a very important question. Um, so obviously, um, working with AI it can be a little bit tricky, uh, especially when you have models that require a lot of data to train. So one of the things we realized through this uh, project, I think, was the fact that um, we needed to train the model. So initially, obviously, the the, the, the bias uh, that, that, of course, uh, has just been highlighted, you know, was sort of we could see that through the data and as and when, you know, we had more data to sort of uh, work through the model and, and make sure that sort of the model learns that uh, we the quality of, of the data comes through. Now, uh, one thing that that is important is also uh, the fact that what we end up ended up with is that we 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 had um, a set of uh, a data set uh, that sort of has been curated uh, through the model and, and classified. But then there was also this is also need, of course, to uh, go in and verify, right? So so we consolidated the leads from that work and then uh, trying a little bit to verify uh, sort of to ground truth some of this where we you know we have some um you know doubts and so on and so forth before we we sort of use this this data so there were multiple layers but the model uh, improved over time and uh we it proved to be quite useful even if sometimes you don't necessarily have to uh, use the entire data set it sort of can inform or it can pose some of those questions that sort of would help you sort of think in, in a way uh, that you could interpret um, the sort of uh, results, yeah. Thank you very much, Anwar. There is um, lots of work for you in the Q&A box. I also want to acknowledge that participants are pointing to the overall gender-based violence and violence against women. Um, I think in your presentation about your initiative, it's particularly um, against human rights defenders but nevertheless, a very important topic when it comes to um, interventions that use digital data and all these new skills and expertise in the UN to look at safeguarding and how technology and others is being used to either prevent, risk, mitigate, or respond to gender-based violence. Thank you, Anwar. And with that, we now welcome Ernesto Trevino, the UN Coordination and Strategic Planning Specialist at UN Women. Ernesto has a long history of and a strong record of uh, program management and especially in development education and coordination in the UN system. With that, Ernesto, over to you. Uh, for sharing about using behavioral change in your interventions. Thank you. Thank you, Gerda. Can, can you hear me there correctly? Hope so. I can great. hear you well. Great, thank you. Uh, great to see the work of, of sister agencies such as OHCHR and, and UNFPA. Thank you to colleagues Priscilla and, and Anwar. And thank you for the opportunity to speak in this series of webinars. Uh, I will try to very quickly explain in the following minutes how we at UN Women started using behavioral science 
to address men in the communities where we are implementing development programs for, for women. If, you, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, particularly, we're gonna talk about the experience we had with a program focused on delivering quality education content to women in indigenous communities. Women that had left their studies at one point in their lives and were now able to restart their learning journey. This program had a focus on three types of outcomes for women, going back to formal education, accessing the labor market, or starting a business. From the needs assessment phase, it became clear to the program team that the number of barriers women were facing in this context was diverse and that they were multiple barriers. From the lack of skills to access basic technological devices to many others, such as lack of time due to unpaid care work, security to get to the learning centers, and many others. And one of these barriers was the structure of social norms that discriminated women from participating in these activities, of course. So we designed a complex uh, web of partnerships that could help us address some of the barriers. Local governments, uh, civil society organizations, private sector companies, and, and others. The structure you see there on the right side of, of the slide is an analysis made by the RAND Corporation on the partnership strategy that the program was using. It was considered by, by them uh, an example of, of partnership creation. In the next slide, I wanna talk very briefly on how we started addressing the discriminatory social norms and they soon proved to be extremely challenging, this issue of, of addressing social norms. In one of the meetings where we were presenting the program to the community, we heard many women say, I would love to join the program, but you would need to speak to my husband. This, this really set up before and, a, and an after for us as a team. It became obvious to us that we needed an effective strategy to address the men in the community and to ensure that we had the level of participation that we expected. We set out to build a team with expert consultants on masculinities, our civil society partners, which were uh, a grassroots organization with very long standing links to the community and the UN Women team. We used results from previous research based on behavioral insights to shed light on the types of messages that we needed to use to ensure the participation of men in this in these spaces. Uh, in the next slide, please. We opened what were called conversation workshops and tried to promote the participation as part of the program and as spaces where men of the community could develop soft skills. The workshops were based first on creating awareness of the inequalities faced by women, presenting positive behavior and positive norms modeling. We prioritized the creation of safe spaces where men could feel free to express. Awareness raising was really pivotal at the beginning of the conversations, talking openly about gender bias, the challenges that women face, unpaid work, violence against women, and of course, those issues that also worry men, such as daily pressures and how pressure from peers can easily transform in engagement of risky and toxic behaviors. This is something that can take time to address, uh, since many times discriminatory social norms have become part of the social identity of a group or a community. The role of the facilitator with an understanding of diverse behavioral science approaches was key. The facilitator portrays a role model for the men of the community. He's also part of the, of the positive deviance approach that we use showing examples of how equality driven male behavior, such as corresponsibility, can be transformative for a home and therefore for a community. The organization acting as an implementing partner, as our, our main ally in, in the community, with strong knowledge from the community was also key. It played a role of positive norms promotion. Men see men from their own community, close to them, portraying these positive social behaviors, not only external role models. In general, the results of the program have surpassed the expectations. The target number of women for the program in Mexico was of 5,000. It is now about to reach 9,000 women. Although we know this is multifactorial, we know that the work on breaking barriers regarding social norms has really been key for this. Men, although not in the focus of the program, have found such a valuable space to express in these workshops that our partners constantly report that they receive requests to continue having these workshops, even in communities where the program has already concluded. I would just like to finish off saying that our experience in this program has proven that behavioral science and programmatic approaches can be key to start transforming social norms at the local level. That this approach boosts women's empowerment and agency recovery, and that these transformations are quintessential for sustainable development results.
Thank you so much, Ernesto, for sharing this really interesting um, initiative. And while we see questions coming in, um, again, a question for you that comes from my side. Um, with interest about what are the main drivers for behavioral change when addressing men in women's economic empowerment programs? Would you like to respond to that in more detail? Yes. Uh, such a, uh, an important question and something that we're, we're still uh, getting to understand and getting to, to really uh, try to, to see what, what the, the best solution for that is. Uh, in our experience, the, the main approaches that we use and that, I, that we think were, were the most effective uh, drivers to, 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 to create this change was, first of all, to raise awareness, to, to be clear on the facts, to be, be clear on, on, the, on the situation that is happening, to be, be clear that everybody has the same knowledge of the inequalities that are, being, that are happening in the community, that are happening in the households. Uh, social norms modeling, to see how this can be different and how it can, can it work if it's uh, different? That's also uh, an important driver. And of course, we also found that positive deviance was 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 an interesting approach to use to see how by using a different uh, behavior, by using something that could maybe not be seen as normal, you could get also good results when trying to deal with basic day to day situations or solving problems, solving solving co conflicts and uh, and doing any type of, uh, of conflict resolution in, in a community. Thank you, Ernesto. And there's lots of questions now. Um, I'll try and combine two uh, for you that have some upvoting. So there's interest uh, from the audience to learn more about the impact of the intervention. Um, I also see a question that asks about continuation of the behavior change and what you saw there. And um, the last piece of that question would be, have you been able to replicate this in other contexts or countries? Yeah, these are these are the two main challenges, the, the, the two that, that you're mentioning, scalability and sustainability. These are the two main challenges, no, no doubt of, of that. We think that uh, sustainability depends a lot on our on the on our on the partnerships that that we that we uh, make in the in the in the area where we're working. If this is something that we can uh, mainstream through policy, through uh, education curricula, through uh, a small policy intervention interventions from local governments, there's more chance for sustainability. We're still uh, finding out how this can be uh, done. This is something that we're still working on with local governments, not only. In the in the area where where we uh, implemented this program, also in other in other countries, but this is definitely one of the challenges uh, because it has to be the, the solution is really a person to person uh, uh, solution. So so it's 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 a, a huge challenge to have scalability on on this. Uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, sorry, I was talking about sustainability. Regarding uh, scalability. Uh, Again, it's something that depends on on how can you attend this from person to person. So, so this represents definitely a challenge on, on scalability. At the regional level, we are searching for different types of practices from other programs and even from local government partners that can exemplify how these types of spaces for men can be part of local public policies. So that, I think that this is this is the, the way that we can go forward in both scalability and sustainability. But we do have clear results of the men requesting to continue with the spaces. This is a need in the community, and this is something that we noticed that this is was it was being very well received by the men in the community. Thank you for sharing, uh, Ernesto. Since now our uh, participants have really warmed up, and more and more questions are coming. Um, let me take the liberty to ask you one more question that was upvoted. Um, question to you, how you prioritized on the barriers that you found for women and what exactly did you do in the workshops with men? I think that really kind of concrete aspects are of high interest to our participants. Uh, I understand the part on what did we do in the workshop, but the other part, can you, can you repeat that again, please? 
the it first was part about of the how you prior prioritize on the barriers that were found uh, for the women. There was no way to prioritize really. We uh, on the barriers. There it was so many barriers. We we what we tried to do was to try to in parallel work with all all the barriers, and that's why we we created this. Uh, what I showed, uh, this complex web of, of partnerships where we could deal with some barriers with some partners and at the same time deal other with other barriers with other partners. So it was really a multidimensional in parallel work to try to see uh, how, how we could uh, start implementing the program without having this. Of course, what you see uh, when you start working with this is that if you don't start to work the psychology part of, of, the, of, the, of the program, this, the, all, all the effects that discrimination has had on on the women on the community from a long history of, of of discrimination if you don't address that first there's no way to access education and high quality courses after you, you need to to address the first part so so you have to do a parallel intervention to, to see the barriers but you have to address that part uh first on what we were doing in the conversation workshops it's, it's what I mentioned. First of all, is to raise awareness. It depends a lot on the on the capacity of the facilitator. But it, first of all, it has to do with raising awareness to understanding. It's the only way to start understanding that there needs to be a behavior change when you when you have the understanding of what is is happening. And after that, you you try to exemplify how these things can be different and how they can also be uh, correct and that they can lead to good to good uh, solutions and to good results by having different approaches to uh, an argument, to, to seeing how uh, women are, are facing unequal access to education or to the labor market. It's, it's about awareness, modeling, and exemplifying how these models can also lead to good results. Thank you, Ernesto. And because there was a question about how you leverage partnerships, it's an amazing uh, segue into the second part of our session that is really about discussing critical enablers. And it is absolutely the first question that we have for all three of you is, what is the role of partnerships? And allow me to ask you, especially regarding women-led networks, uh, local and community-based organizations. And since I have you, Ernesto, would you um, like to be the first one to share your response? Yes, of course. As I was saying, partnerships, partnerships are key to ensure success uh, in breaking the multiple barriers that, that women face to access improved means of, of livelihoods, mainly due to the fact that barriers are diverse and multidimensional. So that's why you need multiple partners to, to help address uh, this. Women, in particular, what we are mentioning, women-led organizations were key in two moments, particularly when creating cooper cooperatives to leverage the strength of productive associations to ensure that women had better commercial outputs from from what they were learning and what they were producing, and the second moment was when ensuring that government partners and sometimes even civil society organizations required a clear feminist approach to drive empowerment processes in women participating in the program. Our, our women-led organizations, our partners in, in that were key for this. And what I mean by this is we partnered with recognized feminist organizations in the communities or in the country to ensure women rights components for the start of the courses. We found that this was key for women to recover agency and be successful when taking all the other courses. So that, that would be, I think, the main part. Thank you, Ernesto. And now over to Priscilla for her thoughts, why partnerships are key and critical enablers. Thank you, Jenda. Um, just as Ernesto has outlined very articulately, partnerships allow us organizations to leverage each other's strengths uh, because no one can do everything alone. We need to leverage those strengths that we don't have and to be able to address um, uh, different shared goals, but using different capacities that come from uh, different angles. And that is the main reason even uh, that we are having this conversation today, because we are trying to leverage the different capacities and skills and strengths from the rest of the UN 
and uh, hence the UN 2.0 initiative. Um, the success, for example, of uh, the population data portal that I spoke to is underpinned by robust partnerships spanning multiple sectors and constituencies. For example, we collaborate with S3, a leading GIS solution provider for geospatial portal development, and also with the UN Global Service Center to support the portal's powerful ICT infrastructure. We work very closely with our governments. I mentioned about the censuses, but that's not it. Um, there are many other you know, components of our work that comes from government collaboration. So in this manner, we are able then to create a very dynamic uh, environment in which the partnerships can draw from different angles in order to achieve a greater impact. So for us to be able uh, to even advance the key issues that we work on uh, in UNFPA, for example, harmful practices and so on, as Ernesto has mentioned, we partner a lot with female uh, women-led networks and organizations. Uh, more recently, we had uh, a convening at UNFPA in which we brought multiple partners to look at measurement of women's autonomy and agency in sexual and productive rights um, and, and health and rights. And this included uh, civil societies, young people, older ones, you know, uh, and from UN, from uh, academia, and so on. So our partnerships, therefore, is really what can bring impact if we have to make, you know, uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Um... Anwar, we had the question before and flagged that this is the segment for you to share more about the partnership with Data Manor. Thanks, Garda. And um, yeah, so the partnership with, with Data Miner was, was quite uh, important for us. Um, and um, we, within the project itself, we worked closely with the social impact team that was female led and an engineering team who, who, who had a, a, a male team actually. So we had we had good gender balance, I would say, within the uh, the different teams. Um, and I think one of the the things that was really brought on was the fact that we we while we were training the model and then looking at the different aspects of things, it was good to look at it on the gender lens. I think that's really helped us to sort of extract the information in a way uh, that could mobilize uh, our responses and, and sort of make those uh, proactive uh, decisions. Um, the partnership uh, obviously um, also helped us uh, to augment some of our uh, and consolidate some of our data sets across OSHR with, with data miner or also being used in some other parts of the house within the organization. So we were able to sort of uh, pull that together. I think what's really important uh, in these partnerships is is that um, there was a firm understanding uh, of the importance of principle based innovation and, and the partnerships uh, that we build obviously uh, begin that collaboration. So, uh, for example, um, data miner um, in, insured and 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 you know. They always wanted to know, for example, what is the sustainability of this project uh, going forward. So uh, not only do we come in and work together on a specific output, but more importantly, how does the organization take on this project, uh, build capacity to absorb such project. Uh, and I think that's really what helps to build trusted uh, partnerships in, 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 this, uh, in, in this space. Um, they also worked uh, Working with us on the project, I think, also informed uh, the approach to similar projects within within the UN family, uh, and also within within OSHR. You know, there were, it sparked other ideas uh, on you know a potential of using these types of, of partnerships. For example, looking at hate speech and other aspects of the of the civic space. Thank you so much, Anwar, and. Um... Before we turn again to questions from participants, we also have another critical enabler that we think will be important to discuss right now. And that is the role of senior leaders 
in inspiring and driving transformation and doing things differently and applying our quintet of change. While I have you, Anwar, would you um, want to elaborate a bit of how you uh, perceive the importance of senior leaders, um, especially in OHCHR? Thanks again, Garda, and a uh, very important question. I, I think that the environment that, that we, uh, as the UN, and mo more importantly, uh, partner organizations that, that we work with, uh, uh, both at a country level, regional level, and, and at all levels, uh, who we work together on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I think the environment that we operate changes very rapidly. Uh, and also the advances in technology have really uh, sort of catalyzed uh, a lot of the things. Um, and I think it's important to have the support of senior leadership who champion uh, and create an enabling environment that stimulates you know, creativity, uh, risk-taking in some cases, uh, and also uh, uh, support continuous learning, which I think is, is crucial in advancing uh, UN 2.0. Um, and, and this is what we need I think uh, as 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 the UN and and, and as as you know the world and our community, you know, in tackling some of the global uh, challenges. In this case, uh, for data miner, um, the first alert platform, uh, I think it, it uh, that formed sort of the the initial partnership with, with UN Global Pulse and data miner, and I think that was led through the Secretary General's initiative, innovation initiative. Uh, to support the UN family. So we sort of uh, piggybacked on that, uh, which I think was a, was a brilliant idea of how, you know, you can enable an environment to, to get into these types of partnerships um, at, at the top and make sure, and, you know, and, and sort of it trickles down to, to the day-to-day -day work of, of organizations like, like OSHR. Within OSHR specifically, uh, having the space to explore uh, and, and have to explore creative ways to overcome the barriers uh, such as the data gaps, for example, you know, resources in terms of capacities, and of course, thought leadership on use of open source data uh, to inform uh, our strategies was really critical. So we need sort of um, to take some of these uh, projects, uh, try to see if, if they work, if they can add value, and if not, you know, uh, we sort of uh, quickly evolve into finding other areas where we can, you know, we can we can explore and 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 sort of uh, harness all, all this creativity. The involvement of senior leadership is also crucial, I think, in in providing strategic alignment within the organization itself, uh, and also providing this follow up office uh, approach. I think UN two point zero cannot be implemented by you know specific teams, uh, you know, or, or just the people uh, around it. I think it, it needs everybody to collaborate uh, across the entire organization and beyond uh, to make it a success. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anwar. Um, turning to Priscilla, what, what can you share what senior leaders need to do for driving change? Thank you. Just following on uh, Anwar's um, very good intervention, um, I think how senior leaders must lead by example. <laughs> And I think that is what the Secretary General has done in um, you know, providing the platform uh, through the data strategy uh, for us to focus on specific issues, uh, but outlining them very clearly in terms of the quintet of change. And that in itself has propelled us to the platform that we have today. Uh, because if that was not the case, we wouldn't be speaking about the UN 2.0. So that example is important. Secondly, um, as senior leaders, um, uh, including myself maybe, uh, but I know the seniority level that we are talking about, they are pivotal in championing a culture of data-driven decision-making, uh, fostering that innovation and uh, and um, and challenging you know, employees uh, to, to be creative and to do things outside of the box. And I think where we have that adaptability and a growth mindset in leaders, they often inspire the entire organization to embrace change and to strive for continuous improvement. 
And senior leaders play a critical role, of course, also in setting the vision and direction. Um, without understanding desired outcomes or goals, it becomes challenging for everybody in an organization uh, to perform at a level that is expected. Uh, I must commend, for example, UNFPA recently established a data and analytics branch that was conflated in a population and development branch. But now this is recognition that a dedicated data, you know, unit within the organization will propel us, you know, further along uh, because that will then position the organization as a data driven organization building on the comprehensive UN ecosystem and maximizing the data value. So, so for us at UNFPA, our aim now is to really to better, uh, to use analytics to better understand the what needs to be done, the why we have to do it, how we should do it, and using robust data um, that we access from different sources and you know, as evidence from the population data portal that I've just spoken to. So, so would like to use that opportunity that the organization has given us in order to leverage these capacities, uh, not just within, but also outside of the organization. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Priscilla. And last but not least, Ernesto. How do you think senior leaders in UN Women are creating an, an enabling environment? Thank you. Yes, absolutely agree with, with colleagues. Uh, what, what Priscilla was saying, I think, is key. Leading by with, a, with an example, leading by the example, and, and also making sure that that becomes institutionalized, like, like, the, like the data branch that Priscilla was mentioning. Senior leaders are, are key to clarify and to guide towards a strategic results. We, we need to, to ensure that senior leadership has clarity on, on results, on impact, on, the, on, on a real capacity to, to impact uh, of the UN. We, we, we need to have this vision from the, from the leadership and ensure that the planning and the programming reflect this capacity for impact. Uh, to give you very quick two examples, in UN Women, we have a strategic plan that focuses one of its outcomes on working with men and boys and how can this have an effect on our development results and gender equality? For me, that is a way to ensure that that vision is placed in the planning, is placed in, in the way that we work. Uh, similarly, at the regional level, uh, we, we have a social norms transformation and behavioral change as one of the main objectives of our regional strategy and, uh, and, uh, and our results framework. So hoping that this can really become a cross-cutting element of all our programs and all our partners' programs in the long run. It is, it is one of, a, of the two focuses of our strategy in the LAC region and this and, and building national care systems. So this is a way to really try to take to, to our programming the, the clarity of vision that senior leaders are, are, ha, have been able to, 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 to set. Um, these would be, I think, my, my main two points. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Um... As I have been monitoring the Q&A box, I see there's lots more questions coming in that relate to your specific initiatives that you presented in the first segment. So if I can invite our panelists to maybe answer them directly um, in the Q&A box, but uh, maybe time permits us and I'll just throw this question to whoever in the panel would like to answer. There is curiosity about how do you become a partner if you have not had any UN connections as yet? So as we value and have spoken um, about the importance of partnerships, especially um, with female-led and local organizations, is there any advice you would like to share on how to um, apply for or become a partner of maybe your initiatives or in general. Do I have any volunteers in the panel to speak to that for a minute? <laughs> I can start and uh, I'm not sure who is asking the question, but I, I don't think there's an application for being a partner. I think it should naturally 
evolve based on the comparative advantages that we bring to each other. Um, you know, acknowledging, you know, uh, the role of the different organizations and what we, uh, what our mandates are and what could be, you know, the comparative advantage that uh, partnering uh, could bring. So, so there is no harm in reaching out. You, you have met us now online. So feel free to drop an email if you like to discuss, you know, something of interest and we can see whether it's us that you need to partner with or another UN entity. So we can also make those connections uh, based on our own knowledge of who is doing what. So thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. And maybe to add, especially female-led organizations working across these uh, new initiatives and that, as Priscilla said, have a shared value for a partnership and also bring and complement um, one another with us, um, especially at local level. Please be in touch with the UN agencies, learn about what programs might align and start your conversations. And with that, um, I think we're coming to the end of our sessions. So uh, it was for me, I really enjoyed this amazing conversations. So I would like to thank really um, all three panelists for joining, for sharing, and also all participants for the active engagement that you had in the Q&A box. Really appreciate it. Thank you for spending this hour with us. Um, please note that you can also access the recordings, not only of this session, but of all sessions during the UN 2.0 week. It will be on the YouTube playlist and you will also be able to find the link to the slides that we use today um, on this platform. Again, before I go, I'd like to encourage you to join any of the upcoming sessions of the UN 2.0 week and or to sign up to the UN 2.0 mailing list um, to stay in the loop, to learn more, to share and to be those uh, peers, leaders and colleagues across the UN um, that we want to be in driving this important um, initiative forward. With this, I wish you all a wonderful rest of the day and say goodbye and thank you. Thank, thank you, colleagues. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye.